Okay. So, so this week we're going to talk about distributed computing and a, a few things that I think that are really interesting about the cloud and why it's so unique are that it is a huge distributed computing system. And in some sense, you can think of the cloud as a nether operating system. And I think that's one of the best ways to think about the cloud is that you have your laptop operating system or your desktop op operating system that could be Windows or Linux or OS 10. But the cloud, in a way, is its own form of an operating system, but it's a, it's a distributed system. Uh, and there's some challenges that occur when you're dealing with a giant distributed system. And in particular, one of these challenges is eventual consistency. And with eventual consistency, uh, a good example of a service that takes advantage of this is Amazon DynamoDB. And we'll get into that in this diagram here, which talks through the CAP theorem. And the, the concept behind the CAP theorem is that there's a trade-off between uh, being available, uh, being consistent, and also being uh, fault tolerant. And the trade-off here is that uh, every data request in the case of consistency is received, uh, and it's the same data. In the case of availability, you're always able to return back a healthy response. And then in the case of fault tolerance, the system continues to function as messages drop between nodes. So this is really a core theorem for cloud computing and why there exist things like a NoSQL database or Cassandra or um, a lot of these distributed database systems is that in a traditional SQL database, really what they've been focused on is consistency. Uh, and and also uh, a lot of times they'll, they'll make a trade-off for, uh, let's say, avail availability. Uh, but in, in a, a NoSQL database, uh, one of the things that they're that, that they're doing is they're getting rid of consistency. So they feel like it's okay for eventually uh, the user to refresh the web page enough times, and then they'll they'll get back the result. Versus a uh, let's say a payroll system, you want to always have back your results. But then the cost of that is that you're going to have to give up something. So that's really the the core th uh, thinking. Another core principle that we'll get into is this concept of Omdel's law. And what it means is that there's diminishing returns with parallelization. And in particular, if, if you look at this graph, this is one of the, the problems with CPUs in general. Uh, right around, um, I, I think in the early, early 2000s, there, there, there became more and more multi-core machines but the software itself is still, even to this day, 20 years later, has not really been able to fully address these multi-core systems. And so as a result, you can see not only are there limited performance gains, but if your code is not parallel, uh, you can have actually very, very little performance gain by using multi-core machines. So that's really the, the idea with with um, multi-core systems is that if you bought, let's say, an AMD uh, chip right now, I, I just saw one yesterday that had 64 cores and 128 threads. If your software packages can't take advantage of that, you just spent $3,000 on a machine that has very limited um, advances. But if you have something that can take advantage of the parallelization because it's, let's say it's 95% parallel, then you can get uh, a pretty decent you know, I guess in this case it would be processors. It would be, you know, right around let's say a 10x speed up uh, by by using 128 threads. Another core concept is this concept of elasticity, and you'll see this a lot with cloud computing in terms of, uh, you know, let's say a load balancer, right? A load balancer in cloud computing, what it does is it has a health metric that you as the author or the architect of the system uh, create, and the health metric will allow you to add a node automatically uh, if, let's say, the CPU reaches a certain level, or uh, in the case of scaling down, uh, you're able to actually remove a node so that you're not paying more 
for services than you need. And this is really one of the core concepts of cloud computing that's most misunderstood and, and most likely is, is probably not implemented because it requires the skill to design your infrastructure so that it can have these elastic capabilities. And one way to take advantage of these elastic capabilities is to make sure that the best practices of the particular cloud are followed. If they are, uh, it really could be a, a substantial savings for, for the people that are using the cloud. And uh, in terms of highly available, there's another one that you'll hear quite a bit with, with uh, cloud computing. And someone will say, you know, is it highly available or, you know, you know, what is what is this highly available uh, concept mean? And, and really what it means is that the system can respond with a healthy response uh, and it, it, it actually has a, a very limited uh, downtime. And so in the case of Amazon S3, this is probably one of the best examples of this is that they have actually even more than nine nines, which is 99.9999999, you know, et cetera, reliability. They have 11 nines of reliability. And, and I believe that Amazon S3, which is their storage system, uh, is so reliable that it's, that it's got 11 nines. So it's essentially almost never in a, in a year, maybe a millisecond, you know, on average, it, it would be down. And the reason they can do this is that they have a load balancer again, and they have copies and they have replicas all over the world to, to make sure that their system is always available. So if you spend enough money, if you're a cloud provider and you have the resources to do this, you can make a system you know, highly reliable. And so this also is a good reason for using cloud systems, especially the highly available cloud systems, because you can take advantage of the economies of scale of the cloud providers where you as a you know, maybe a, your own physical data center or your own small company, or even just personally as a hobbyist, you're not gonna be able to afford building something like this. It's just not feasible. Uh, and, and this is really one of the advantages that cloud providers offer. Uh, so let me just dive into these concepts a little bit more and just sketch this out and talk through, you know, how they manifest themselves in a real cloud deployment. So one of the things that, uh, that I've seen uh, as well in, in, the, in the cloud world is, is this co concept of highly available. And one of the things that you'll see this really used with is websites. And there, there is some documentation I have on the book, Cloud Computing for Data, that goes through how to set up a Hugo website but one of the reasons why highly available for websites is so important uh, is that if you had this, you know, copies of the data replicated everywhere and, and even globally, uh, not only do you get great performance because the data is actually in, in copies everywhere uh, performance, but you also get the, the highly available. So they're, they're they're kind of tied together and with s3 it's it's a perfect uh configuration for for doing uh static websites and static websites uh, are are great technologies to be aware of because of the fact that they're you know great performance highly available and simple uh, and the reason why they're so simple is that they use serverless technology and what's happening is that behind the scenes with a static website, they have all this infrastructure, you know, built out to serve your web page. But but in a static website, the author, in the case of let's say Hugo, all you need to do is uh, run, you know, Hugo uh, itself the command, and it will spit out a bunch of files. And those files, let's just say it's you know index.html. Uh, and uh, you know the JavaScript, and we'll just say JavaScript here, that all those files will actually uh, be, be synced over to this, this S3 environment via hopefully a, an automated deployment process via continuous delivery. And, and so this is really why 
these cloud systems have these tools is that they make something that in let's say even in the early era of web development uh, th these were very challenging problems to build websites in 2020 and beyond we'll just say 2020 and plus this is a trivial problem to build a website that is on scale of the new york times or uh, on scale with uh, you know wall street journal or some large publication this highly available uh, technology plus the also the serverless technology where they're able to provide all of the the components to serve out a a website for you uh, which is bucket based hosting and then also they they hurt they serve out um, dns via route 53 they've they've essentially solved completely this problem for you and they're going to give you their core infrastructure and, and it's a, it's now a trivial problem so you can build something that essentially could scale to the whole world and the deployment takes let's say uh you know it could take two seconds to deploy changes and new articles uh, so it's really a, a, a tremendous uh, offering for for people that can leverage the cloud. So I think this is a great way to familiarize yourself with cloud computing is to master the static web server and uh, also the continuous delivery by using the cloud native platform. In this case, the AWS cloud platform is called AWS Code Pipeline slash AWS Code Deploy. They, there's a couple different ways to, to, to name it but this this really is captures the essence of uh, cloud computing now let's um let's talk about the next topic here uh, which is uh, elastic machine learning with notebooks so another thing that does come up quite a bit in the cloud computing world is this concept of the Jupyter notebook being the center of the universe and I've, and I've seen this over and over again, where the Jupyter Notebook itself can be uh, a really core component of both data science and machine learning. And every vendor, so AWS, Google, Microsoft, they all have some form of a Jupyter integration. And some tasks are more oriented in the direction of engineering and other are more oriented in the direction of science. And here's a good example of this, uh, maybe make this a little bit smaller, is that in the science focus, what you'll see uh, oftentimes when you're starting a project is that you will do exploratory data analysis, you know, some visualization, um, you know, potentially some you know, team and group work, you, you'll share a project. And a lot of that is really not focused on building machine learning models, it's more about figuring out how to work with the data and move it around. And then at some point, what most likely will happen is that the team will get into source control and they will you know, check the notebook into source control. And now once you start to get into this realm, it, it starts to get into the engineering focus. And in, in my opinion, in 2020 and beyond, the, the hottest skills right now are machine learning operations or ML ops and ML engineering. And that's all of these, all of these components. And let's just talk through them one by one. The, the first one here is ML training. So with ML training, you're, you're building slowly, you know, model, not slowly, you could be very fast. You could be building models that distribute uh, at cloud scale. Uh, and that's one of the advantages of Jupyter that we'll get into in a second is that you can, uh, natively take advantage of uh, distributed algorithms like a k-means clustering algorithm that can run on many nodes. Uh, also, there is uh, deployment. So in, in these Jupyter-based systems, there's always a uh, you know endpoint where you can push the model and then it could either be, do the prediction in a batch mode or it could do a prediction as an online uh, machine learning deployment. Uh, another core component of Jupyter is uh, Data Lake. And the Data Lake is where you would keep all of the centralized assets so that you can apply data governance, you can uh, make sure that uh, you're using the, the assets efficiently, you can have large assets. And again, Jupyter Notebook is often the integration point. 
and I, I, and I will today actually show both Amazon uh, Jupyter Notebook and I'll also show Microsoft Jupyter Notebook to show and compare the differences how both platforms use this. Also, GPUs are a key component. You'll see this a lot. Uh, GPUs will be heavily used uh, in these, these systems. And, and one of the reasons why Jupyter is a great execution point for GPUs is that uh, you can spin up the Jupyter Notebook and tell it to deploy the training to a cluster that has GPUs associated with the cluster. And uh, again, I'll show you an example of that in, um, in Azure. And then uh, another uh, core component of Jupyter is that you'll often see there's a heavy Docker format integration. So maybe the model itself that you use in Jupyter is coming from Docker, or you know, maybe even you could deploy yourself uh, a Docker container. But, but this is always in the wings here, uh, integrating with your system. And then ultimately the cloud platform itself has deep integration with Jupyter. So if you are doing machine learning engineering, ML ops, most likely this will be the central uh, you know, central point for you to start. And I think this is a, a source of confusion for many people is that they're, they're, you know, they don't know exactly where to build their machine learning system in the cloud. And my advice would be at this point, really Jupyter Notebook, the, whatever cloud platform hosts it, that's, that's really where you should spend your time because they've already worked out a lot of the configurations that you need and the workflows that you'll need. So let's further talk about some of the things that can happen in a machine learning uh, slash data science workflow. In this particular example, this is really common that, that when I teach data science or I'm teaching uh, machine learning, first you ingest the data and the data could live in a, a, a bucket somewhere, it could live in a storage system somewhere, or it could live in you know, a SQL database. You then do exploratory data analysis on the data uh, so, you know, visualize it, look for outliers, look for scatter plotting, and then model the data, right? So you can go through and come up with a unsupervised model or a deep learning model or a supervised model or, or whatever algorithm, and then, and then write up your conclusion. So this workflow uh, fits really well in, in a markdown workflow. And so if I was building this, I would recommend that, that when you're, writing this out in your Jupyter system that you, you conceptually think through uh, how to put things into these sections because typically this is this is the the flow that you would have in your project. Now there's a newer form of um, automation that's occurring with with uh, Jupyter uh, called DevOps for Jupyter and DevOps is something I've written uh, at least one book on and it's a combination of Python to automate software development. And really the center of the universe in DevOps is the build server. And so with the build server, the user checks in the code and uh, the code uh, then triggers a, an action and then we will build something and then test uh, either uh, a report that passes or uh, and gives us uh, some kind of result and then also does the deployment. So, so really the build server in a DevOps workflow uh, is kind of the center of the universe. And, and this word DevOps is, is actually being merged into a new word now called MLOps. And I'm also writing a book called MLOps. Uh, and re really the topic is similar in that everything is mostly the same but the, the core idea here is that not only are you automating the, the source control uh, and automating the quality, but you're also automating deploying the machine learning model and making sure that you have a good story for the data. Uh, so, so this is an important concept to understand. And, and some of the benefits of continuous integration are that it, you're constantly making your code better, right? And you're looking at data. You're looking at the data of what happens on, on a build. Many times what I will do is I will use a make file and I'll also use a Docker file in my projects. And so this is just something to be aware of. This is an example of a simple flask app, you know, for example. Now in the um, DevOps for, for Jupyter workflow here, 
here's an example of a source control system where uh, you know I could have everything together. I could have a make file. I could have a Docker file. I could have some tests. I could also have uh, Python packages defined. I could have a Jupyter notebook, and they all fit in this world of a of a build server here. And ultimately, the culmination, and, and I'll make this a little bit bigger, is you get something like this, which uh, is a typical uh, workflow for a SageMaker project. Is that this is an example of of one project where you you would uh, first start the the host instance and that would be running on its own compute node. And then uh, you would go through and ingest the data. So where would the data live? Well, the data would be retrieved from the data lake. In this case, it would be uh, Amazon S3. Next up, you would do some kind of exploratory data analysis. So, you know, look at the, look at the data, look at the histogram, look at the min-max scalar, um, you know, figure out what's happening. And then once you decide you know what to do, Next step, you would move to modeling. And then in the modeling phase, it could involve multiple machine learning steps. In this particular example, there's a distributed machine learning model that does principal component analysis. And notice that it forks off its own cluster. And this cluster would do all the heavy lifting for doing principal component analysis. Uh, and when it's done, it will save the data into the data lake as an S3 asset. Next up, with uh, distributed modeling, you also have a k-means cluster that, that also launches, that also launches multiple nodes. And then in these multiple nodes, what would happen is that it also would uh, write out a model uh, to, to disk. And then we're not done yet with spinning up the nodes is that now we have to make the decision as the machine learning engineers, what, do we, what, do, how, what kind of a prediction do we do? Do we do a batch-based uh, prediction? If it's a batch-based prediction, then we could just temporarily spin up some nodes, they would run a bunch of predictions and then the nodes would go down. If it's an online prediction, then what would happen is that you would create a elastic endpoint. And the elastic endpoint could also involve multiple nodes and those nodes would then constantly serve out predictions uh, to, let's say, customers uh, or internal clients to your company for both models, right? In this case, because principal component analysis and k-means clustering themselves need to work together, right? The principal component analysis first uh, compresses the features, right? It takes the columns and reduces them so that the clustering algorithm will be better at it. Then the clustering algorithm would, would also take that principal co component analysis input. So you would have two models in production. So you have a, a few more nodes here. And the idea uh, is that even though SageMaker is the center of the universe, it's only one single node, and each of these are different clusters of machines. So in a real world cloud-based machine learning engineering project, uh, there is actually a, a high amount of, of, of machines that get spun up and, and utilized and you can also see how it's heavily dependent on this S3 data, you know, data lake. And so I think this is probably one of the more misunderstood aspects of machine learning at scale and why the cloud is so important is that in, in the terms of cloud computing, that uh, this, <coughs> the, the in, in terms of cloud computing, that you know, this particular topic uh, is is critical in, in terms of uh, understanding why you can't do this on on your laptop, and I can make this a little bit bigger I I as well here. So the 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 core idea here I again is that multiple multiple machines uh, are are involved in, in doing distributed cloud computing. So what what I was going to do next here is is um, just also talk about let's say both the AWS distributed machine learning, and then also uh, Azure machine learning, and then show examples of, of how to do both. So let's go really quickly and just just re redraw some of this. So so the core idea with uh, with cloud machine learning.
is again this notebook, right? And so the center of the universe is the notebook. And this notebook uh, is very powerful because it allows it allows us to to kind of dispatch things. And in the case of Azure, uh, which which maybe I'll start with first, they they heavily utilize this concept as well, in that uh, they they will let you uh, have a compute node, and this compute node uh, will be the place where where the uh, notebook is hosted, right? And so it's just one single node. It's just one one machine, uh, and then for the training you'll separately need to set up a compute cluster and when you set up a compute cluster you have a few options uh, and in particular one of the options that you can choose uh, is to uh, you know spin up maybe gpus and one of the other things that you can do and we'll just say gpu here that's that's really uh, powerful about setting up a compute cluster is you can say I want zero nodes to let's say four nodes and, and what does this really mean what it means is that the, the, the cluster will be idle and you don't need to spend any money for the cluster until you you distribute a job to it and then when you distribute the job in the notebook let's say on line 30 of the notebook this will invoke this cluster and it will do the distributed machine learning and in fact not only can it do model training, but this cluster can also do very advanced things. Uh, some of the advanced things that it can do, be, besides just traditional machine learning, is it can do AutoML. So you can actually tell uh, the Azure platform using Azure ML Studio. We'll just draw Azure ML Studio. You can tell it, I want you to automatically train this model for me uh, and come up with some results. Uh, you also can pick uh, hyperparameter tuning. That's another uh, key uh, finding of, of Azure. And what this means is that you can tell it that you still wanna have the, the core control over the, the system, but you want to give it, let's say, some parameters for uh, picking the right amount of clusters. A good one would be k-means clustering. That's a simple one to explain you could tell it that you wanted to do a parameter search so that it can automatically find between two to 10 clusters for you. And so instead of you having to do diagnostics, going through and figuring out how many clusters to pick, you, you tell it using their feature called Hyperdrive, automatically go through and pick the correct number of clusters and then give me back the result. So really these cloud platforms uh, are oftentimes uh, maybe even a 10x improvement in, in the workflow. Now, the other thing that we didn't talk about in the case of Azure, maybe maybe I'll draw both since there's not enough room. I'll say Cloud ML with Azure is that you also have to have a data set somewhere. And what do they do? They also have their, their data lake uh, in, inside of Azure. And what happens is that you can register uh, a data set and then it can very efficiently uh, utilize that data set in a notebook and i'll show you that as well uh, so so really there's there's a deep integration with with the cloud platform itself and the workflow is pretty much impossible to do on your laptop and and this would be called in my opinion cloud native uh, machine learning and the reason why it's cloud native is that these capabilities are not possible on any other platform unless you utilize the, 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 the tool set here, right? So you're getting additional functionality by specifically tying them to a cloud. So, 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 so this is Azure. Let me just also briefly talk about AWS and then we'll get into some demos. So in, in the case of AWS machine learning, if we go here, uh, the way the way it works is very similar is that again you have the the s3 cloud and that's that's really the the core place and it can it can take infinite data and infinite or near infinite uh, storage and near infinite disk io and compute uh, and 
and the reason for this is that they've designed it to be just basically able to, to, to take an unlimited amount of, of work. And so a notebook where again, you would spin up a, a compute node, you can, you can go through here and then tell it to, to launch uh, Jupyter. And then from here, that Jupyter notebook would do a similar thing. It would fork off a job, you know, a training job. Uh, and this training job would be however many nodes you want, you know, let's say four, four nodes do its work. And then when it's done, that, that model that's created would, would live and live in S3. And then if you wanted to do, you know, online machine learning, you would spin up a cluster of machines. And then this cluster of machines uh, could serve out the prediction. One thing that AWS does in particular, and, and theirs is called SageMaker, one of the things that they do that's pretty interesting is that when they, when they serve out a model, they can do A-B testing and you could serve out multiple models and you could have one that is uh, getting 80% of the traffic and then another that's getting 20% and you could look at how well uh, each of them are performing and then decide to swap completely over. So you could be continuously training new models, getting new data, getting new results and constantly trying to, to put those into production, seeing how they perform and if they perform well, then replacing the existing model. So this also works really well with this concept of uh, continuous delivery. So what I'm gonna do next here is, is get into Azure and I'm gonna show first a very simple workflow of how we could use registering data and then also then using the data that's registered to do AutoML. So we would be using a cluster. Then I'll get into using the notebook. So first up, let's go to Azure here. Go to the portal. And with the Azure portal, uh, what I will do is go to uh, machine learning and then I'll type in Azure ML workspace and I'll say launch studio. And uh, the, the first thing to do is, is to register a data set. And that's typically the, the workflow that, that many people would use. And so in order to register a data set, it's a pretty straightforward process. I would click on create data set and I can either upload a file. I can use something that's already in my cloud system. I can even grab things from the web. So let's say I wanted to get uh, the MNIST data set. I can just give it that data or I can even include data sets that are here. So they have a really clever way of letting you ingest things into a cloud platform. In this particular example, uh, I'm gonna select from local files here. And I have a data set that is a pretty popular data set that's in my GitHub that's also a Kaggle project. And I'm just gonna use one of those data sets. So the data set here is called uh, uh, NBA <coughs> players with salary, Wikipedia and Twitter data. So what this does is this was from a few years ago and this shows the NBA players, their performance and it also shows uh, some data that I collected manually. So I have some data on their, their salaries, uh, how popular they were in terms of um, Wikipedia, like how many people visit their pages, and then also Twitter, how often are people uh, viewing these celebrities on Twitter, right? So we've got, we've got a good combination uh, of all these. So from here, I'm gonna go to raw, and then I'm gonna say file, and then say save page as, and then save that to my desktop, perfect. Next up, what I will do is now go back here and name this data set. So we'll say NBA data uh, social. And then I need to select what kind of data set it is. This is tabular because it's a CSV file, but I could just load regular files. Let's say it w if it was, um, uh, you know, images, for example, that I was gonna train a computer vision model with. So we'll just say uh, this, this is a CSV file for NBA data. Great, that looks good. Once I register this, 
this is where the cloud storage again uh, as well. And with the cloud storage, what's useful about it is that we're able to slowly build out the, um, the, the solution into, into our system by putting these blobs into the data store. And so from here, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to select the UI pathway. And this UI pathway will allow me to uh, import this data. Perfect. And then if I say next, uh, it will pull this into the cloud system. So, so this is actually something that now gives me the ability to tweak it a little bit by ingesting the data. And in particular, I could go through and change the file format. Uh, I could go through and uh, do comma delimited. Uh, I could add headers. And in this case, I would want to do that. I'll go ahead and select the column headers and say use headers from the first file. There we go. And if I say use headers from the first file, it, it will show me each of these header positions. So uh, really it's, it's doing the work of a, of a data scientist for me, right? I don't have to hire somebody to do this. I just click this file and I, and I load this, I load this in there. Next up, uh, I could also go through and change the schema. Again, this is a, the work of a lot of times what people do, and it could take them a while to go through and make the right types and the, a pandas data frame, for example, uh, is it an integer, a string, a decimal, but it's able to infer it automatically and even if it wasn't I could change the type here myself and I could I could change the the format so this is a very powerful tool that, help, that helps me save a lot of time in building out uh, a machine learning project uh, next uh, all I need to do is say create and, and once I create this uh, it's now going to be available for me to do machine learning and so from here I can pull this into a Jupyter notebook and actually use the data. In fact, uh, let me show you one that I've currently, uh, I, I already uploaded that data earlier and uh, I, can, I can actually just pick this one, it's the same data. And one of the things I can do with this is, is actually even look at it visually and explore it uh, without needing to, to do anything with, with the data, right? So I can, I can visually look at this data, uh, look in fact at the distribution, right? I can see, the players, uh, positions, how many of them there are, you know, th typical descriptive st statistics. And if I click on this icon here, it, it even will show me, um, you know, more advanced uh, breakdowns. Like, for example, show me a histogram, and it'll show me a histogram or, or a box and whis whisker plot where I can look at the, the you know, the different distribution of age, like the oldest player in the NBA at this year was, was 40 and the, the median age is 26, the third quantile is 29. Again, these are things that, that these high level tools really automate for you. And it, in my opinion, shows the power of, of the cloud. Now, let's say I wanna go a little deeper though, right? And I wanna use the, the notebook to, to do the work. Well, uh, how do I do this? Let's actually look at this compute section here. In this compute section, what it does is it has several different options available for me. They have an instance, which is just a single instance that will run a Jupyter Notebook. Again, this is the kind of the central dispatch. And notice that it's running right now. And if I want to, I can launch a Jupyter Notebook. There's another tab, which is a compute cluster and that's this one. And this compute cluster would be where I would define different types of clusters. And let me just walk through what it would look like to define a compute cluster. Let's go ahead and say new. And from here, I could decide, you know, new cluster, for example, uh, and I could pick what region. Uh, also the type, I can choose between a CPU, I can choose between a GPU. And then I also could, let's just pick GPU for a second. And this is a really powerful feature is that you can say <clears throat> dedicated or you can say low priority. And the, the reason behind this is that you can get a cost savings by using low priority. <clears throat> so for example, 
you could say that you wanted to uh, you know, use these low priority nodes and you don't care if the job gets canceled because it's just a, an experiment. And, and I think many times people would want the low priority. They wouldn't want uh, the dedicated because of the cost savings. And then I also can just pick which of these machines and there's really powerful NVIDIA GPUs like a Tesla, you know, P100, and you can see it costs, you know, 80, 83 cents per hour. Uh, and it has, you know, lots of cores. And then this is where I would set the parameters, right? So, so what are the parameters I want for my cluster? I, and this is, again, goes into distributed computing is I can say, I want to elastically scale this up and down where I always want it to be idle. So no nodes are running if I set this to zero. And then if I want to go and say, I want 10 of these to, to spin up, it, it, could, it could peak up to 10 if I needed 10 nodes, if I'm doing lots of jobs. And I also could decide the, um, the scale, right? I could also decide how, how many seconds do I wait before it scales back down again. And maybe this is something that uh, you could tweak a little bit but in a nutshell, that those are the way you set up a cluster. Now, I've already set the set up clusters, so we don't need to do this. But in particular, if I look at, let's say, uh, this uh, GPU cluster, demo cluster GPU, you can see uh, the the characteristics of it. And it has a very good visualization uh, here where it shows you, you know, how many nodes are, are actually running, what's their status, and then we could actually go through here and look individually at how many are actually provisioned and then even look at previous runs uh, if we wanted to. So what I'm gonna do next here, now that we've gone through the compute clusters, actually, let me show one last thing, which is inference cluster. So we have the node for running Jupyter. We also have the compute cluster, which will do the heavy lifting. And then we have the inference cluster. In the case of the inference cluster, what this job is would be to serve out online predictions. And so if I wanted to create a new cluster, uh, I could create a, it would create a Kubernetes based service for me. So it could basically manage this cluster for me and I could, I could tell it how many nodes to, to, to spin up. So it would basically take a, a Docker format container and run it in this Kubernetes cluster. And it, and I could just give it, um, serve out predictions to it and, and I would just hit a URL endpoint. So in this particular example here, you could see you know, that this cluster is running uh, and I could later you know, pull this particular cluster in, into, into my application and, and use it to serve out uh, exactly my, my prediction. And you can see it, it ties back into the, the Kubernetes service in uh, Azure. So there's deep integration with other components of the Azure platform. And you can see here, here's the API address, right? If, again, if I wanted to do API endpoint calls to it. So now that we've gone through the compute, what I'm gonna do is go back to the compute instance here and go to Jupyter. I'm gonna click on Jupyter. And this will spin up a notebook for me that now I can start to write code against my, 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 my previous uh, registered data set. So this should just take a second. And if it if it's taking too long, I'll just click it again. I don't know why that's that took a while. This one. <clears throat> there we go. So now that I've I'm spun up here, you what you'll see is a, a, a traditional Jupyter notebook, right, that that we can use to build things. And from here, if I go to new, you'll see that. You, you can do Python 3, but you also could do Python 3 Azure ML, which would be a deep integration with the SDK for Azure, or you could do R, uh, or you could just spin up a terminal. In this case, I'm gonna select Python 3.6 Azure ML. And what's, what's great about this is I can have a, a notebook that I can use to explore. So we'll just call this NBA uh, Explore rename this. So how do I get to that data that I registered earlier? 
what I can do is go back to the platform and go to data sets. And uh, I could pick this one, for example, that's the one I just loaded and say consume. And notice that it gives me the default way to access that data. So it gives me basically the, the code block to pull it out of storage. So I'm gonna go through and copy this right here. I'm gonna click on this and then I'll go back to this notebook. And I, maybe what I'll do as well is change the cell type to markdown at first to put the ingest section. So from here I can say, you know, ingest and then this is where I ingest the, the cloud register data. There you go. And then shift return. And then what it'll do is it'll go back to my cloud system and go through and pull up the data. Great, and now we see that now I can actually manipulate this data right from in this uh, in from this notebook. So there's a deep, deep integration that's super powerful here. And what I also can do is I can go down to uh, here and say DF, so make a data frame, and then uh, put this into a variable. And now I can start playing around with the data. So I could say df.age, uh, for example, uh, maybe I wanna look at the, the, the median age. Right, and I could just start playing around with it, doing doing whatever I want. So, so this, in my opinion, is really a, a powerful way to quickly build solutions in the cloud. Now, let's 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 actually now use a more advanced feature of Azure, which is their AutoML system. And what the AutoML system does is it allows me to train a model without needing to know any code at all. And so I'm going to click this button here. AutoML, and I'm gonna create a new AutoML run. And I don't, again, I don't have to write any data at all. And it will tell me either to create a data set, but we already created one, so I'm gonna use that one, or use an existing. In this case, it's the NBA data set. I'll go ahead and use that, and I'll say next. And now, what I will do is I'll say, I wanna create a new run. A run is just an experiment. So these are ways of logging what it is that you've done so I'll, I'll go through here and say, uh, create a new experiment. And we'll, what we can do is predict the uh, NBA positions. So can I create a model that could look at the data, maybe the rebounds, the blocks, the assists, or even social media data, and predict what is the ideal position for a player, right? And so maybe this, a coach of the NBA team would run this so that they could figure out if somebody's in the wrong position, like they would be better suited to a, to a different position on their team. And then I'll look at the target column and I can pick what, what is it that I wanna predict. In this case, uh, I, could, I could predict again the position. That would be a categorical position. And now, now we're back to the compute cluster. So this, this is where I can use all that cloud computing so I'm going to select the demo GPU cluster. So I'm gonna tell it, hey, I wanna do GPU-based classification using, in fact, and I'll show you, we can choose to even use deep learning automatically, right? So let's say I want to um, you know, use the power of deep learning for this. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. And then in classification, it, it tells me that this is a way of predicting one of several categories, yes or no, blue or red. In this case, the position, there's only I think five positions uh, on the court uh, in the NBA. And so it's gonna pick between five positions. If it was a regression model, I could also do that. Or if it was time series, uh, I could also do that. But I'm gonna go ahead and say, enable deep learning. When I say finish, it, it will go through here and create a, a new uh, automated ML run. So this will take a while, it maybe will take, let's say 40 minutes, but it'll go through and, and spin up a cluster, launch it, and you can even see that I could even watch the cluster you know, as it starts to spin up, it'll show me what it's doing. So you have great visibility into what's happening. Uh, I've already done this previously, so I can go back to an existing experiment and we can find uh, this NBA position predict and what's, what's powerful about this is I can go back and just pick one of the previous runs. And from here, you can see that 
it was able to use this XG Boost classifier and it picked that for me. I didn't have to tell it which algorithm to pick. Again, this is what a typical data scientist would do is they would go through and kind of try all these algorithms, but with AutoML, it would directly tell me, it even tells me the accuracy. So we, we have a, a model with 60% uh, accuracy and the duration, it took 29 minutes to come up with that solution. And what I can do as well from here is um, go through here and, and select that algorithm and even look at other metrics. So I could go through and see all the different metrics, uh, very advanced metrics on, on how my model performed like area under the curve, for example. The, the other thing that it does that's, that's really critical in terms of a machine learning workflow is that allows me to do model interpretation and this allows me to see what are the features that drive this prediction and what we can see here is that if i hover with my mouse over this variable which is i think this stands for a uh, assist total so like essentially how many times have you passed the basketball to somebody right before they scored uh, and if you look that there's there's a different color coding and it shows it shows us that particular positions um, are much more suited towards assists, right? These, if if I was going to predict who would be a point guard, uh, since that's the player that has the ball in their hands the most, that this this would be probably the most important feature, is to have data on their assists. And you can see that in fact uh, it's it's overweighted by a long by a long shot, uh, the assists. The second most uh, important probably is this uh, power forward uh, also assists uh, are a big predictor. Uh, this is a more interesting stat. This is ORB or offensive rebound. We can see that uh, the, the small forward, the point guard, the power forward, and then the center, these are heavily weighted uh, in, in terms of, uh, of these larger players. And this, this makes sense that, that the big tall players in the NBA uh, are able to you know, heavily use uh, offensive rebounds. They can grab a missed shot. Uh, and so I could go through here and start to dig into it and, and, and maybe collect more data or, or, or do more things uh, by, by looking at these. You can also look at a couple different views as well. So if I click on summary importance, it, it'll show you a different view, which shows more of the, 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 the value in terms of um, the spread, right? So in, an, in a nutshell, a uh, really powerful way to, to look through the data and decide what features are making the model. So maybe you still later go to the Jupyter Notebook and build things by, by scratch. But in my opinion, why not just do this first, get, have the machines do it for me automatically, and then I can decide whether I wanna do more advanced machine learning. I'll also note, note that if you click on metrics here, you can also individually pick metrics as well and again, these are things that a data scientist would typically do. So for example, if I wanted to look at a confusion matrix, that's a, that's a typical problem that I would do in a machine learning problem. Uh, I can go through here and I can scroll down and see this confusion matrix that shows me uh, how successful it was at categorizing uh, the, the data, right? And we can see that there are some, you know, successful trues, there's some, you know, the, there, there's some misses as well. Like in this case, it misclassified a power forward, misclassified a point guard, right? But, but it mostly got these true. And maybe in these cases, the small forward or the shooting guard, they were, they were less likely to be successful. But in a nutshell, this AutoML is a, is a really powerful new component that, that cloud providers are starting to build tools around. So now that we've gone through Three, three components, we've gone through the Jupyter Notebook, we've gone through, which is on a compute node, we've gone through a compute cluster, and we were going, gone through the AutoML. Let's now dive into a more advanced, full integrated model using Azure ML Studio. The way that I would do that is I would go back to our, our Jupyter hosted instance. And, and in general, this is a great way to learn the cloud platform is to look at their sample notebooks. And in this case here, we have Azure ML samples, and I could 
look through all of these different samples and, and find different models that, that I could use. So in particular, one of them would be this uh, auto machine learning, right? So I also can hand code auto ML as well. So if I go through here and I select this, you can see all these different uh, examples of, of how to do uh, automated machine learning. And I think one that's, that's pretty good could be this auto ML classification bank marketing. So if I click clone, this will clone the, the model and then it allows me to, to build out this whole system. And notice that as I talked about previously, that you've got this workflow where you have essentially the ingestion, you have the training. And one of the key differences with, with this platform, with Azure Machine Learning Studio, is that they're also heavily weighting towards getting you into a deploy process. So, so this is heavily ML ops friendly, the uh, Azure platform. And in particular, what I can do here is um, just walk through step by step and show how this would work. So the overview is that this is how you could encode using their SDK, build a classification problem and deploy it to an Azure container instance or a ACI. And the goal is to do classification. And you also, if you want to, can export the model into Onyx format. And what this does is allows us to convert it to a to an open format that that's a high that's a widely used standard so that that model could live anywhere it could live on uh, another cloud platform it could live on you know your laptop uh, and, and so this is another advantage of using their their system is the ease that you can actually pull the model out and you can see the steps would be step one create an experiment step two uh, tweak the auto ml using auto ml config uh, train the model, uh, explore the features, do inference, uh, register, create a container image, and then de deploy it. Uh, so the first part would just be a bunch of imports. We could just go through here and uh, run these imports. And then um, next up, I can just double check the version uh, of the software. And then if I scroll through here, we can uh, look at the, the workspace and the workspace is where you hold all of your data. So I can go through here and say shift just like that. And it, it gives us a printout of, of all the workspace. Uh, next up, I would need to create uh, or attach a compute cluster, right? So we've already done that previously in the GUI, but in this case, uh, if I scroll down here, uh, you could either programmatically create the cluster or in this case, because we already know we have a cluster available, uh, I could just put in the name of my cluster. And let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to go back to, to Azure here, look at my compute cluster, and look at the name. And it says uh, Demo Cluster GPU. Great. So I'll go ahead and use that. So I'll say Demo Cluster GPU. Type that in. Demo Cluster. And what it should say when I run this is it says, oh, yeah you already have a cluster running and found existing cluster and it's going to use it. Great. And, and now we load the data and remember before by walking through the, the data set registration process, pretty straightforward process is that if it's already in um, the a tabular data set form, it's pretty much ready to go. We can put it into a data frame very easily. And so this is already, living inside of the Azure platform and it can be pulled easily in and we can look at a just you know a just dis distribution of the data and then from here this is typical stuff that someone would do in their their model they would you know clean it up a little bit so I can just run these examples and just clean this up and run this clean this up this is essentially just cleaning the data a little bit I can put some test data which I again can grab from the Azure platform, uh, not as interesting, but the, the interesting stuff would be, now how do we do auto ML via the SDK? And the way we would do that is by uh, running this next section here, which would be instantiate an auto ML config. We, we have to just tell it, is it a regression or classification or forecasting? There's three kind of auto ML models. And then what is the primary metric that I'm, that I'm shooting for? Uh, 
you know, area under the curve, for example, would be a, a good metric for classification. How many, how many uh, iterations before I do a timeout? And then I also can tell it as well, what are the types of classification models that, I, that I'm allowing the AutoML system to run? Uh, you know, in, in some cases, you know, for a, an author, you, you maybe don't want to run certain models because it will take too long or you don't think they'll, they would perform. So you still can use your judgment on that. Uh, and then you even can block models. And if I scroll down here, there's other parameters as well. You could pick uh, when, how many hours should it run, right? Which is, and can you enable early stopping? So for example, if the model has got good performance, why not just stop? Uh, and then you can also you know, change things as well, like cross validations. So in a nutshell, this is what it looks like. If I scroll down to this page, is you have the AutoML settings that all appear inside of this uh, Python dictionary. And then you go to AutoML config. And, and really this is it. This is, the, this is all it takes to train the model using this cluster is I, I pass in this configuration data. I then tell it that I wanna run a classification model. Uh, it goes through and it um, runs this compute. And then I also tell it which you know, some other parameters like whether I should enable the Onyx compatible model, which would allow it to be portable. You know, when can I exit? So let's go ahead and run that. And if I say shift return, um, it tees it up. And then to actually submit it, I would say experiment.submit and then it kicks off the job. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can say, there we go, it kicks off the job. So it's now gonna run on that cluster and, and go through and, and build our auto ML system. How can I see it running? Well, if I go back to Azure here, we can actually look at this GPU cluster. That's one way. And it should be in a state where it's, it's, it's doing something, right? So we can see that it's running. This cluster is actually running. Uh, and then I also could look at experiments and we can see AutoML classification bank marketing. And, and it can show me that it's actually in process of running, right? So it says here starting. Right, and so it goes through and it, and it shows me the start. Now I've done this job before uh, many times, so I can, I can show you, cause it, let's just say it'll take uh, 15 minutes or something. So we'll go through one that's already been run. I can again go to uh, run ID and I can see that it selected, it went through a bunch of different models and it selected one called a voting ensemble. It shows me the status here uh, and also it deployed it. So I could use this model and serve out uh, predictions. Uh, as well, you can actually go here to models and I can see every single model that it tried for me, right? So it went through and it tried this max ABS scalar SGD, logistic regression, XG boost classifier, you know, all these different algorithms, but it chose the voting ensemble because the accuracy was the best accuracy right here. And also the duration uh, took, it even shows me the, the duration that it took. And because this is the one I selected, I can actually say, you know, view explanation uh, and it will show me uh, the feature importance. And we can see that in this particular model, the customer, the duration that their uh, client of the bank was the most important feature to, to do the model selection. Uh, and then the second most important feature was whether they were employed or not, right? So, so really as a data scientist, this pretty much gives me everything I need to know, but I have even more control over, over building this, this model here. Now, uh, one of the other things that we can do that is, that is um, uh, fairly interesting with AutoML on Azure is that if, again, if I go back here and I go to models, I could select a, you know, one of the models that it didn't pick, like let's say this one, which is pretty close in accuracy, uh, and I could select it, and then I could also say explain model, and I could go through here and again give it this GPU, and say, hey, I also want you to explain this one because I just want to look at both, right? And and so you also have ability to go in here and to add additional tweaks 
and, and, and ask it to do more and more explanation as well. So really, as a data scientist, my opinion, this is a super tool because you can dive into the code and you can build out the machine learning auto ML configuration yourself, you know, step by step, or you can click on a button, do auto ML, uh, and then you also later can go in and look at it. Let me show you one other feature of this, this system, uh, which is called the designer. So if we click on <clears throat> designer here, one of the things that, uh, that, that's really powerful is that you can actually, uh, there's a GUI that allows you to build machine learning models without writing any code. So you could do not only the auto ML, but you also could go through and build out a, a, a full pipeline of all of your code just by dragging and dropping uh, examples. So let's maybe look at um, a binary classification problem here. And if I minimize this, what it will do is it will ask me, uh, hey, I, I, you know, you want, do you want to run this project? And it, and it has all these steps in the project, which I could write in code if I wanted to. There's a one-to-one -one correlation in the notebooks, but maybe I want to do this with a GUI. I, I could do this and I would do the same thing. I would go through here and I would say select compute target. It would select a demo cluster GPU. Uh, and then uh, I could go through here and say submit. Uh, again, I would say do a new pipeline run. In this case, um, you know, a binary binary classification, and then do a do a submit. All right. Once I've submitted this, then it it will appear just like all those other projects. We can see step by step. You can say you know income. You you can see feature based selection. Uh, you can see you know, training the model, scoring the model, all that stuff is, is all available uh, inside of here. Uh, and again, I can individually, step by step, look at these components. So, so this is also a new feature uh, that, that's a paradigm that is, is really powerful for building machine learning is that this proprietary platform also has these high level GUI tools. There's also a tieback though, as I mentioned, to the notebooks. So if we go back to the notebook, let me show you how this works. So if we go to here and uh, I go again and I open this back up, uh, if I say uh, Azure ML samples, one of the samples that they have is a, uh, it's I believe under ML pipelines, is this uh, New York taxi data regression. So, so it, it actually, you can define in code and then also tell it to, to appear in the designer. So let's go ahead and see how that works. So you have kind of a tie back there uh, and you can maybe use the best of both worlds. So if I go to this notebook, this is a, a taxi regression model and we would first prepare the data. So this shows how by using Azure itself and by using their cloud storage system, the data lives already in Azure and I can just suck it in. So from here, I can say this, I can say shift return and then look at this data just like this and then pull up a uh, data frame and then go ahead and visualize the data. So by using these open data sets, it's really quick quick to, to get started with, with, with building something out. There we go, I've got this data and it's in parquet format, which is a big data format. Next up, what I would do is download this locally and then upload it into a blob uh, inside of the uh, Azure uh, ML platform. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll go ahead and save this, that looks good. I think this thing must have timed out or something. We can, we can run it again, go through here. Or, or restart the kernel. Maybe I've got too much stuff because I have multiple kernels running. The the so I can I can just restart and run all. There we go. That that would probably work. In a nutshell, though, what'll happen is that that these will actually go through and and create runs that will appear in the designer. 
right? And so I, I, I can control it all from the notebook, but it'll appear back in the designer. So what I'm gonna do next is show you, now that I've kicked off all this work, if we go back to the um, experiments here and I look for the taxi experiment data, which I believe is in um, pipelines. Here we go, NYC taxi data. Is you can see that, okay, it's got a previous run that was completed, it took 45 minutes. But if I select this, it pops open the designer again. And I could actually, if I wanted to, drag and drop the, the data. So I, I can really control things either way. So I can, I can control things by first starting with a designer and then uh, you know looking at the, the parameters or I could go into the notebook and tell it I want to create designer steps and then later I could go through and analyze each one and tweak them and change the parameters. So uh, I, think, I think this is probably a pretty good overview of, of how you can build very powerful systems and, and the power of using Azure. So we have a little bit more time what I'm gonna do next is just show a little bit on, on AWS and show how some of these same capabilities work on the AWS platform. So what I'll do next here is go to console and spin up uh, an AWS solution. We'll go through here and uh, open this up. And in particular, we can do auth. Here we go, 097. Perfect. So with AWS, very similar again, they have something called SageMaker, which is essentially an equivalent platform to Azure ML Studio. And they also have a newer platform called Azure ML, I'm sorry, uh, Amazon SageMaker Studio. But the, the core concept is the same as that. They have a centralized notebook. They also let you do distributed training jobs. They also let you do inference and then they even will let you do uh, pre and po post processing after you've done the model evaluation. What does SageMaker Studio do? It does some of the same things as Azure ML Studio in that you can do auto ML and automatic hyperparameter tuning. And so that's really the, the core feature of using SageMaker Studio. To, to get started though with, with this platform, uh, a few things to just point out here on the left is that really this is your, your guiding light for, for using the uh, AWS SageMaker platform is this is where you would launch your initial notebook. When it's doing um, processing, you could look in here. If it's training a job, you would look in here. And if it's doing a prediction, you would look into this. Typically, the way I would start would go to a notebook and then I would you know create a new notebook from scratch. So let's go ahead and try that out. We'll say, you know, um, data science, create a notebook here. And then typically you would pick the size of notebook. Uh, you know, I think a medium or just the default most of the time is, is good enough because all of the other parts of, of SageMaker do all the work. So you don't really need a large uh, machine. You could though attach something called elastic inference. And this also highlights why the cloud is so powerful is that you can attach a GPU that scales up and down based on, on your, your use cases. So if, if you did want to, to do some kind of GPU-based uh, inference, uh, you could attach it to this notebook and, and use that in a very efficient way, use a GPU, GPU. Also, for permissions and encryption, uh, you know, there are a few things to, to realize. One is that by default, you'll, you'll need to have the ability to call the SageMaker API and also S3, which is their storage. And uh, you can actually either create a new rule or use an existing rule. Like I could just use an existing rule I'd set up. And then for root access, this would be whether you'd want to give the users access to the, the file system itself. So depending on the security requirements, maybe you wouldn't want someone to have access to the root of, of the file system. And you also could encrypt the data as well. So you could automatically encrypt the data on the disk. So, so maybe two, if you were in medical records, for example, you know, maybe what you would do is have, don't give the users access to the root access. Maybe also 
give them an IAM role that specifically ties them to a, a particular bucket so that they can access all of the buckets and then also encrypt the data. Th that could be a, you know, a security best practices uh, for your organization. I'll go through here and just say uh, create notebook. One thing to point out though, is that you can actually automatically check out code, which, which could be useful if you have your own custom notebooks. But let's go ahead and create this notebook instance. And this will take uh, a few minutes to, to spin up. So a, a couple of things that I'll, that I'll point out about SageMaker is that you, do, you will be charged for the notebook itself. Uh, and, and this is something that is pretty important that uh, if you are doing machine learning on the SageMaker platform is to make sure that you're, you're not uh, just kind of having a notebook hanging around it's probably a best practice to just stop it when you're done and notice how I've done this before. I've gone through here and I've stopped the, the notebooks. Uh, and, if you, and if you don't need the notebook anymore, another thing you can do is if I'll go through here and I'll click this, is you also can just delete them. That way you don't have to pay for the storage, right? So I can just delete that one. Here's another one I did earlier. I can just delete that. So it's pretty easy to, to um, use this interface. But it's it's a very important thing to check. When you're processing, though, this is a totally separate or training. These jobs will appear here in this interface, and they'll show you the algorithm, very similar to the Azure ML Studio work, you know, spaces that they'll they'll show you the algorithm, and then if you click on it, uh, it'll show you how long it took, and then also it will go through and give you the location on disk. Where, the, where it lives. So if we go through here, you can see that it put this model into S3 and that's where, where I could actually, if I wanted to just even download it and, and, and do something with it. Maybe I wanna deploy it in a different way. Um, the other component for cloud-based machine learning here is this inference component. And in this particular example, uh, what, what we can look at is actually models or, or endpoints. Let's look at endpoints. And what endpoints would be, if I created one, would be uh, essentially, you know, do I wanna create a new endpoint that serves out traffic? Here we go. And then do I wanna have a couple of different models where I have different weights? Uh, and, and so if I, if I went through here and I said add model, I could pick, let's say, k-means clustering. And I could say, here's the one variant, and then I could pick another caveman's clustering here. And then I could decide, you know, what's the weight I want on both of these. And I could try it out. I can see what's happening. And then what it'll do, if I, if I, I won't do this because it takes 20 minutes, but basically it'll spin up these endpoints. And then I can actually be sending traffic back and forth and, and, and load balance between the two and, and then measure what's happening and figure out which of these models is working best for, for my needs. So this is definitely something that is, is really powerful that you can do that's, that's unique to SageMaker is this concept of um, you know, A-B testing your, your, your models. Uh, the other one that I'll mention about SageMaker that, that's pretty neat is that if you go to search here, uh, you can also look at all of the jobs that have run, and this could be great in a, in a large corporation where let's say you have 10 or 20 data scientists or machine learning engineers constantly building models, what you could do is actually build this model uh, here and say uh, training job status and look for ones where it equals um, complete. And so if I do a search here, uh, I could look at all the jobs that have completed successfully uh, and this, this might be where I would then go and deploy those to production, or maybe I could look at failed. So I wanna look at what people were working on last night, and I could go through here and, and search search through and see, uh-oh, we had some problems last night. I, maybe I need to look into the code and, and, and fix this. So, so I think this dashboard for, for SageMaker really is the, these kind of things are the future, and you can see that there's a lot of similarity between Azure and also similarity with the, um, the AWS. Let's go back now to this notebook instance and we see it's, it's uh, spun up. And I'll just briefly go through here and just show a couple things about it. 
in general, uh, it's a very similar process to, to use the, the notebook. I would highly recommend going through and going to the examples. Uh, notice that there's mini kernels as well on here. So there's PyTorch, TensorFlow, all kinds of MXNet, Spark. But in general, I think this is a good spot to start is, is go through what it is you want to learn on the, on the platform, you know, PyTorch, FastAI, reinforcement learning, uh, SageMaker endpoints, uh, you know, autopilot examples. Uh, there's many, many different examples here. Uh, but let's just take uh, something fun, reinforcement learning. Uh, I could just pick one of these, let's say um, uh, Bandit's movie lens test bed. If, if I go through here and I pick this, exact same workflow. I would copy it, go inside of here, and then in build out an, an experiment. You can see here, uh, this is one of the nice things about the, the SageMaker platform is they will give you really good documentation with images and you can see exactly what, what it is you're learning. You can see that the notebook spins up and then it's going to communicate with S3. And then the training job, which would fork off in the background, would, would go through and run this simulation and then it would save the results to S3, just as we discussed earlier. So then if you want to look at the code, be very similar, right? I could just say shift or turn, run this code. It would, it would start to call the, the, um, the SDK for me. And then we could go through here and just step by step uh, run the project. So.